It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing three amazing people that you might already know from dentalrealist.com. We have Marcus Naff, we have Troy Steven, and Ryder Waldron. So how are you gentlemen doing today? Doing great. Doing great. Doing great. So yeah, who wants to start off on. and explain to my homies what a dental realist is? Is it short Marcus for did. dental real estate? <laughs> Marcus, Marcus that would be nice. Away. We'd love to get into the real estate business. Um, <laughs> no, dental realists were three guys that uh, went to dental school together, and we we were great friends through dental school. Got out of school, and we realized that you know this dentistry thing is tough sometimes. And we we found ourselves texting back and forth, and and finding out that you know there's some stuff that that would be nice to know, would have been nice to know. Um, so we, we kind of brainstormed and we ended up writing a book together initially, um, just self-published. Um, so you want to be a dentist. We thought it'd be useful to share some things that we learned along the way that, that new dentists, upcoming dentists might want to know that morphed into another book. Um, so now you're a dentist. We started uh, our little podcast called the dental realist podcast and a website, www.dentalrealist.com. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. And so, so how many books have you written then? We've had we've two. had the two out so far. So now, so now you're a dentist, and so you want to be a dentist. There's so, a theme there. So now you are a dentist. Yeah. And that's for and, someone that's already so that was the second book. That was the second book, right. and it's mostly geared toward new de- towards new dentists who are just out of school and getting their feet wet. And we know that we made probably tons of mistakes, and we found ourselves kind of complaining about the same things and talking about the same things and thought, well, this would have been nice to know before we graduated from dental school or right when we got out. So that was our way to kind of help new dentists out. And you guys are all 2003 graduates of Marquette University. Yeah. Yes. Which used to be a private Jesuit school. And then instead of closing it down, they um, made a uh, partnership with the state, right? Yeah, and that was about the time we were graduating, wasn't it, guys? They got a lot of money from the state and yeah. and uh, yeah. to build the new building, and now they're, I think, they, since then, they've even, even added on to the new building. And you, and you know who really single-handedly <laughs> saved that school and and did that whole deal with the state? I think it was Al McGuire. Who's Al McGuire? <laughs> he was a coach <laughs> at Marquette University when it they won the national Randy championship. It was Shaliner of Lord's Dental Studio who just oh, thought mm-hmm. it was yeah. just going to be it. Do you guys know him? Yeah, well, yeah. we don't know him, but we know him, Lords. Him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he was the CEO and uh, of uh, um, Lords Dental Studio up there in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, where I think they mm-hmm. might uh, – they used to have a football team. I'm not sure if they still do, uh, <laughs> the Green Bay Packers. But he was an amazing man, just an amazing man. And when he saw that Jesuits were going to close that thing down, he said, no, 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 no. And he pulled all of his strings, connections. I mean, he literally saved the dental school. How cool is that? Rennie Shelley. Very cool. Lord's yeah. Dental Studio. So let's cool start. Happy. Let's just go in chronological order. Let's start with, so you think you want to be a dentist. What What would you tell kids today? I mean, today already, I've had, already had a couple different texts by, uh, from dentists saying, hey, my kid just told me uh, he wants to go to dental school. So so what, what are you telling them? What, what's your book summarize? And so you think you want to be a dentist? Yeah, well, so no, oh, go ahead, Ryder. You're good. Well, I, I think, you know, when, when we were in dental school, at least when I was in college and then in dental school, I thought that, you know, I, I just shadowed dentists and I saw, you know, the patients come in, they seem happy, they get the work done, they pay on the way out, they reschedule, da, 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 da. But then when we got out of school, we found out, well, usually the first thing somebody says when they walk into your office is, I hate you. I hate being a dentist. I hate, I mean, I hate being at the dentist office. And then you know, it's a it's a struggle to get them to pay on the way out. They don't want to reschedule, and and we were, I think, the three of us getting kind of frustrated with it and and a little demoralized. And we thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with us. I, is that about right, guys? And then we kind of yeah. started brainstorming about how are we going to kind of help to fix this. Yeah, and so the book I think gives just gives some perspective on things that you might want to think about as you're preparing to go to dental school what the profession's going to be like. It, it seemed like we we all kind of had a similar experience and we it, it looked like it was just going to be this rosy, easy thing that you just went through dental school. You got out and boom, it was magic and the money started rolling in. But there's a lot more work, a lot more uh, things that go into becoming a dentist and then becoming a successful dentist afterward. We all three had pretty similar experiences when we were uh, shadowing dentists before we went to dental school. We all, you know, like Ryder said, saw the dentists and everything was just peachy. And 
everything seemed to go really smoothly. The dentist seemed to be very, very low stress. And then when we found out when we were actually in that position, it wasn't quite like that. And uh, so what we wanted to do is basically set the expectations of new dentists, people who are thinking of going to dental school and stuff like that, just so that they can kind of get an idea of what it's really like. Because in the dental community, um, I have found, we have found that people don't like to talk about the uh, stresses as much as they do, you know, the composites and the the drills that you use and stuff like this. So we wanted to talk more about the stresses and the everyday life of the dentist and, you know, what to expect uh, out there when you get out into the real world. Yeah. And also to help them out with, you know, job options. Like, you know, when we started school, I think everybody's dream is to be your own practice owner and be a solo dentist. That's just what, what you do. And now there's, you know, there's corporate dentistry, there's partnerships, there's group practices, there's just being an employer for a, you know, a health community center, you know, there's all teaching, education, things like that. And we even have a friend that's a prison dentist. And these are just job options we had never, at least I had never thought about. I just wanted to get out of school and get working. I had a friend that was a prison dentist uh, when I was an inmate. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's a good friend to have. He's a good friend to have. Well, you know, my, my two oldest sisters uh, went straight into the Catholic nunnery right out of high school. Uh, and uh, I, I always, I, I don't know, it was because my Catholic upbringing, going to Mass every day from birth to, you know, when I left home. But I, I always thought uh, everything was a vocation, not really an occupation. So, I mean, I, yeah. I wanted to be a dentist. I, I just think it's so, my, my, my favorite thing is getting someone out of pain, broken tooth, cosmetic emergency. I mean, I don't. I don't get excited about, you know, a DO composite on three. I mean, you know, I think a, I think a fireman wants to have a five star fire go a five alarm fire going on, I, you know, but uh, but you're right. It, it, it is it is a uh, if it is a, your absolute vocation and passion, uh, then you're going to work through it. and It's going to be great. But if you went in there thinking it was going to be easy money and an easy occupation, you're going to be rudely awakened. Yeah, and we've tried to talk about that on our in our book and on our podcast that you need to be honest with how your personality is. You've got to be honest with yourself about what kind of person you are. And some people aren't meant to be practice owners. Some are meant to be, you know, employees or, you know, other teaching occupation, things like that. And so it is important to know what kind of person you are before you get too far into this. And and you um you along with a, uh, about a dozen other uh, dentists upload your uh, podcast on Dental Town. Yep. And uh, thank yes, you for do. doing that because um, it's. Um, I think most people listen to podcasts on iTunes, uh, but mm -hmm. Dental Town's got two hundred seventeen thousand members, and a lot of them first find it. I mean, I'm, they tell me in emails they they first found it on their iPhone, and then they subscribe to it on iTunes. But uh, you, you, I loved your uh, episode eleven zero cross uh, practice boosters. Yeah, yeah, we like to share just kind of practical stuff. I mean, these are things that. Uh, that we found work or, or, or make a real difference in our practices. So we we really try to share actionable stuff, stuff you can really use and you can put to work. Yeah, so not not everybody can go out and buy a Cerec or a you know the newest you know cone beam something like that. But everybody can shower and dress nice and smell good and you know be polite to people and you know people appreciate that when you are actually personable with the when the with the patients when they come to your office. And give them your uh, mobile phone number, give them your business card, right. give them your cell phone, be available. Uh, there's, yeah, you're there's right. There's a lot of basic, simple things, sure. Yeah, and, I, and I've always told my four boys, ever since they were little, I said, you know, everyone should own their own business because 90% of businesses are, are pathetic. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean I, I've asked my dry cleaner man for almost 20 years, you know, can you call me when my clothes are, can I mean could you just call put a post a note on the cash register I mean you know you know the, pe yeah. people won't, people won't do anything so let's go to your second book because that's probably more relevant I think almost everyone listening has already decided they're gonna be a dentist probably 20 percent of this is uh, dental students and 80 percent under 30 um, so um, now you are a dentist talk about that book so is that on Amazon or would you go to dentalrealist.com what's the best way to buy that book the best way to get that one is on Amazon.com, and you can just search. So now you're a dentist, or you can search any of our names, and it'll be the first one that comes up. And that that's just an ebook, which we it was just easier to get that out to everybody. And 
most people are on some sort of digital device nowadays, and it's easy to carry that around and read it. And, and neither of the books are, you know, they're not, you know, war and peace or anything like that. There's something you can probably read in a day or two and make it really easy. And, you know, we're not trying to overwhelm people. You have enough to do in your life. We're just trying to give you some tidbits and help out a little bit. So, yeah, yeah that what book's could be more... Dennis? What you must know if you want to succeed in dentistry. So what are they going to learn in this book? What should they must know if they want to succeed in dentistry? We just made a huge list. I don't know how many get, how many do we have, like 60, 70 things uh, that we had decided that most dentists should really do. Very simple things. Um, I think, Marcus, I can't remember if it was you or Ryder that read a book about uh, being a father. Yeah, was it I did. Just, it was Ryder, okay. Uh, he read a book about being a father, just some good things that you should do as a father. And he's like, why don't we apply this to, to dentistry? Why don't we get some of these things? So we made this big list, and then we narrowed it down to 30 items. Was it 30, I think, that made the book? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, just kind of really simple things that every dentist should do to, to be successful. Simple things, very simple, like smell good, like brush your own teeth. <laughs> the writer had an experience one time when a dentist – about knocked him over with his own with his the breath of the dentist you know i mean <laughs> something like that you know it doesn't bode well for you as a dentist yeah and, and being nice to your patients i mean we one one thing that i hate is when i get into a, a bad extraction or a bad root canal and then i have to quit halfway through and refer um i you know we recommended that you know if you know you know that you're not gonna be able to finish this refer it don't get yourself into something that's just terrible get it out of your office now and and other you know other things just being polite to people and and what are some others marcus i mean we've got tons of stuff in there yeah so it's broken down into basically we've got what's uh some sections there's practice builders uh section on patients there's a section on employees practice in finance and personal finance so those are kind of the, the broad categories and then within those we we talk about uh, a few different things that relate to each of those main topics and and uh, just share our own experiences, a few details, stories, things like that, that, that really, uh, if you apply them, I mean, it can really make a difference in your practice. Yeah. And we had, when we got out of school, I know, you know, Marcus and I had signed up for tons of advertising things and, you know, spent thousands of dollars on stuff and got, you know, like one patient out of it or advertising in the yellow pages, you know, people, still call me to advertise on their yellow pages. You got to be at the top. You know, people, well, nobody looks in the yellow pages anymore for anything, but they'll want you to spend, you know, a thousand dollars a month on some ad. And it's things like that, that, you know, we got roped into at first and we don't want people to, you know, waste their hard earned money. And especially when you're out of dental school, you don't have any money on, on things like that. You've got other things to spend your money on. So, so let's talk the stairway. So let, let, let's address the, the, the 20%, you know, podcasters are all pretty much under 30. I rarely get an email to Howard at dentaltown.com and they're over, over that. It almost never happens. So you're, so you're, you're coming up on, let, let's just say you just graduated uh, May. This is uh, August 5th. Let's say you just walked out of school, you know, May 5th. Um, chart a path for them. Did you guys take jobs first? Did you go Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine? Did you go corporate? Um, what, what, and, and a lot of their pain, what, you know, just give them advice. Walk them out of school. Well, when I got out of school, and we all have different experiences, which we think is, you know, one of the beneficial things about our podcast. But when I got out of school, I my family dentist, when I was growing up, had some space for me to lease. And so I opened a practice sharing his office and he didn't charge me much. You know, he let me use a lot of his equipment, bought a chair, uh, did some advertising and started building some patients up. In the meantime, I also worked at some other offices, which... I thought was beneficial because I learned a lot of things to do and even more things not to do, how I didn't want to have a practice, how I didn't want to have my practice run. And then about two and a half years after we had graduated, this was in the uh, winter of 2005, I bought my father-in-law's practice who he had been practicing for almost 30 years. And now it's been uh, 12 years, almost 12 years, 11 years, I guess, since I bought his practice. And now he is just barely retiring. He's, he's going to be 69 this week. And so it was good for me because I only worked for about the last 10 years, about two and a half days a week, two and a half to three days a week. And then he worked the other day, the day and a half. And that's been great. But I did work at some associate ships along the way. Um, and but buying the practice, I don't know if I could have done it without purchasing a practice. And I'm glad that I worked at other offices to kind of help help uh, learn some stuff along the way. So it's, safe, it's safe to say your wife knew what she was getting into when she married you. 
<laughs> or, I, or I knew what I was getting into by marrying her because maybe that was my plan to buy, <laughs> to buy her father-in-law's or So we're, her you're practice. in Syracuse, yeah. Utah. Where, where, where yeah. is that? So it's about 25 minutes north of Salt Lake. It's kind of in the, in the Ogden area, I guess is how the best Have you ever it. driven so, from uh, Salt Lake to where I live in Phoenix? I've never driven, but I've flown. <laughs> I'm but, telling you, I'm telling you, um, the drive from Phoenix straight out around the Grand Canyon up through Utah, Idaho, Montana, into Canada, the, the drive, uh, all my, there's so many Canadians in Phoenix that retire for the winter. And yeah. they always wonder how they're going to get their car down here. And they end up just having to drive it down. And then everyone gets here and says, oh, my God, that was just the coolest thing I ever did. Yeah. And they're all trying to do it in like a day or two days and try to push it. And they, and they say that the smart thing to do is just take a week. I mean, Bryce Canyon, the Grand Canyon, all yeah. the buttes. I mean, it's just, that's just well, God's things country. to see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this yeah. area is great because we have mountain. I mean, you can be skiing, skiing in the morning and playing golf in the afternoon some days in, you know, December and January. So it's, but the question, it's great. The reason I ask where you're at is, are you rural or urban? And do you think that makes a difference? Because, you know, when I got out of school in 87, there were no dental schools in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, or Nevada. And now um, just Phoenix alone has two, uh, Midwestern AT still. Um, Nevada has, uh, is it just one in Las Vegas? I think so right now. And then Utah yeah. is two, right? Two. Yeah, we have so, two now. And I'm, I'm up north about a half hour away to 45 minutes away from both of them. It, I don't know that it's affected me yet. My, the city I'm in where I practice is called Sunset, Utah. I'm the only dentist office there and it's about a city of about 6,000 people. And oh so my that's God, great. That's, that's incredible demographics. <laughs> we have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of dentists surrounding the area, but, um, you know, none actually in my in my city, but, which but is nice. But let's talk about that because so um, do, do you, you know, we're, we're talking about you're coming out of school and, you know, start making, um, you know, let, let, let's bite off massive major mistakes. I think one of the biggest, fastest mistakes they make and drown themselves is you wouldn't graduate from dental school and go to the Congo or Somalia <laughs> or Ethiopia. So obviously <clears throat> demographics, matter. if demographics don't matter, then go to the Congo and write me a letter in 10 years. Tell, tell me how that went. <laughs> but, so when they're well, coming out of school and, you know, they're, they're building dental schools, urban, talk, talk about demographics and how well, I, important I can kind that. of speak to that a little bit because I, I came out of dental school and did a startup practice in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, and I, I just thought, you know, hey, I, I, I think I'm going to be a good dentist. I, I know what I want to do and I want my practice to look this way and be this way. So I'm going to do a startup. Well, Idaho Falls... Uh, is a town of about 55,000 people. You get the outlying area, you might get up to around 85, 100,000 people for that, the draw in that area. Well, there's about 82 dentists. So, uh, <laughs> One you know, thousand. Yeah. Doing, a, doing a startup practice in that type of environment, you know, that's that wasn't the, the smartest thing that I did. Yeah, I survived it and made it a long time doing that. But I, I certainly didn't come out of school and just thrive and, and, and you know, go gangbusters. I, it was tough. So you eventually left that area then? I did, yep. Did I, you sell uh, the I, practice? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a long story, but I ended up trying to merge the practice with someone else. That didn't work out and, uh, you know, not a, not a great situation, but I ended up well, now. Is, is that, because, in, that because you were both partners? Yeah, I, I, I came into it as the associate uh, with the idea that we were gonna. I was gonna buy him out of his practice. He took over my practice, and just just was not a good situation. So um, and now I work at a community health center, actually a, a little ways away in a different area, partly because of a non compete clause. But but you know, you look at demographics. I mean, you got to think about all those things when you uh, when you come out of school. And and I'll admit, I probably I really didn't spend as, as much time as I should have thinking about it. Well, and we've talked about that dental schools keep accepting more and more students every class and more and more schools opening up. And they, you know, they keep saying that it's to help the rural, rural communities and help out the underserved. But most people don't graduate dental school and want to go to some, like you said, go to the Congo or go to some underserved area. They want to go where they can start making some money to pay off student loans and get going with their life. I mean, they've dedicated at least eight years to school. It's time to start living. So yeah, demo, I mean, picking the right area has got to be important. And I, I think Troy seemed to have picked the right area because he got out of school, didn't you, Troy? And you just kind of started rolling. I mean, he's filthy rich now. 
<laughs> yeah. So Troy, did yeah. you was this a was this just blind luck? You stepped in a pothole and, and hit gold, or did did you think about demographics? Uh, I did not think as much about demographics as I should have. Just like uh, we've spoken here, um, I kind of lucked into a practice that is. I am in a rural community. I'm in Mountain Home, Idaho, um, which is not far, about forty miles southeast of Boise, and. Um, I was looking at Boise, and I, I had heard that there was a practice available over here in Mountain Home. I didn't even know Mountain Home existed. I didn't even know where it was at the time. And, uh, you know, I'm there's about... Sure it does it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to... Yeah, but uh, the uh, there's about, I think, 17,000 people here, but there are six dentists here. Uh, there have been up to five practices here. Right now, there are really only three because two of them went, went under... Um, so even in the rural communities, demographics, you have to be careful because, you know, they're, you know, the, like we talked, and I think actually, uh, I listened to a podcast of yours, Howard, about, um, Douglas, uh, McLeod, I think that's how you pronounce his last name about how they're graduating too many dentists and that, that hits the nail on the head. Um, it's really one of those things you got to be very careful where you're going because there are a lot of dentists out there. Um, and where you go can make or break you. Yeah, um, we've talked about this on a recent podcast that sometimes taking an associateship and the guaranteed money right at first to kind of learn and get your feet wet, learn how an office operates. I mean, that sometimes is the best way to go. Yeah. You know, it's uh, like, Brazil, okay, so the United States has over 300 million people. Brazil's right about 200 million people, and they have the same number of dentists as the United States because they just allowed – there was no oversight. They just allowed a dental school to pop up on every corner. And I was talking to a Christian coachman, and he said, you know, half the dentists in Brazil will always have to have a part-time job. And you're wow. starting to see the same trend in India. Malaysia just went from one dental school to six in one decade, and it, it's a poor country. And if, yeah. there's, uh, if there's no oversight on uh, the supply, on the supply and demand, um, it, it, it's <laughs> – it's you know, right. it's, there's That's no true. doubt about that. It'll it'll create some uh, winners and losers. Yeah, yeah, that's and, totally and, true. And, and 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 if you're listening to this and you're a kid, I mean, if you come to Phoenix, their first great idea is I'm going to go to Scottsdale because ain't that where all the rich people are? And there's literally <laughs> yeah. a dentist for you know on every corner. And then yeah. you come yep. to Arizona. You know, when I set up in uh, Phoenix, um, 30 miles south of here in Florence, uh, there wasn't a dentist for 10 years. And uh, like an hour south of here in Eloy, there still isn't a dentist. But gosh, drive around uh, uh, Mesa and Gilbert and Scottsdale, and you couldn't throw a cat and not hit a dentist. <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, it's just crazy. So, so demographics are important. Then what else, what what would be next? Well, I I personally I think being smart with your money and you know not buying you know, crazy equipment right out. Cause I, I know when, when we first got out of school, I mean, everybody wants you to, you know, put in a, a panel machine or a, you know, a cone beam or, you know, digital x-rays and everything like that. Well, the practice I bought, it didn't have digital x-rays. It didn't have a panel machine. And so we started, you know, slowly adding those things, but you know, people were telling me, you know, well, you should start doing implants. You should start doing all this stuff. Well, I don't want to do implants and I don't have the patient base or the patient interest to, you know, start placing a bunch of implants. So, you know, I feel like, we get sold on this stuff. And I think Marcus and Troy would probably agree that, you know, the salesmen are there to, to get you to buy stuff. They don't always have your best interest in mind. And I, I hope I'm not like offending anyone, but no, you know, I want you to offend everyone because it seems like, it seems <laughs> well, like whenever, me... I mean, I mean, what percent yeah. of the dent, I mean, be truthful. What percent of the dentists writing articles and lecturing are trying to sell you something? What would you three guess? You're a dental I mean, realist I, I, and you're I mean, on I, dentistry I, uncensored. Yeah. What would I'd you say? say? 75, 80%. And what would you say, Troy? I'd go 90, 95%. Right? I'd probably, yeah, Rider? I'd probably say 99 to 100%. And, and, and like, here yeah. they are. Here they are. Oh, you know, that $18 Impergum impression that hasn't ever let you down in 30 years? Well, you mm -hmm. can replace that with just a $30,000 optical scanner. Yeah. And then they don't even <laughs> tell you all the software yeah. upgrades. And every time you turn around, you're having $1,000 here, $1,000 there. <laughs> And, and yep. a dentist has gone from an eighteen dollar impression or a thirteen dollar impergum to now he's got this massive overhead beast machine he's got to feed, and, and and it's just it's just and then and then they tell you mail out your own crown. So you were sending it to the lab, and the person at the lab has made a thousand crowns a year for a decade, 
and then you put you, you get him back two weeks later and they go no same day same day same day that that that's all the patients talk about dude my practice is 29 years old i've had that request twice when i tell writer he needs a crown the first thing out of his mouth is it gonna hurt is he gonna get a shot are you gonna knock me out can you give me nitrous and then it starts to go into money well, how much is that going to cost? Will my insurance pay? You know, no one says to me. No writer walks in and says, you know, I don't care about anything other than I want it the same day. And then they go invest $150,000, do all this weekend training courses, and, and then they end up delegating it to their assistant who's never made 12 crowns in her life. And it's like, so now we got massive overhead. I mean, it's just, but yeah, that's why I, I call this dentistry and sensor. That's why I love you guys, dental realists. I mean, Tell them, tell them about smoke and mirrors out there. And, well, and, I know. And Ryder, you're nailing you know. it. I mean, if, and, and you said earlier about a family. I mean, divorce, a third's over money, third's over sex, third's over substance <laughs> abuse, and all three of them are just not <clears throat> communicating. You know, that this this is an issue. And and money is what gets these dentists in trouble. They, they sign up for PPOs, which lower their fee 40%, and then they switch to all this high-tech Star Wars dentistry. And no offense to Star Wars, because I know you're the co-host of the Star Wars <laughs> podcast called Idiots Hooray and writes right. blogs for That's coffeewithkenobi.com. Right. You'll have to come back <laughs> and explain what coffeewithkenobi.com was all about. Uh, was this, uh, but, uh, but, but, but this is why I love Dentistry Uncensored. This is why I love dental realism. So speak real with these kids. Well, I know Marcus and I, we had gone to a, an endo course, Marcus, in Salt Lake one time, and it was I think yeah. we paid like $250 for it. At the end of that, I walked out of there and I paid nine hundred dollars for these amazing files and you know this new endo system that's going to make my life easier. And they were fine; they were good files. But I've also seen we've talked about this a lot. I've seen uh, root canals that have lasted thirty years and it looked like they took a straight nail and just pounded it into that that you know canal, <laughs> and they still are lasting. So I'm thinking, what did these guys do thirty years ago that was so much worse than what we're doing now? Except that we're spending more money to do it and getting paid less. So. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. I mean, if, we you, could if, talk you, about, yeah. if you get the infection out, it, it's a success. I mean, my endodontist used to tell me, you know, if you got this tooth, all the infection out, all the bugs out, you got it totally cleaned out, you could obturate it with sterile bird droppings. <laughs> I mean, he used to always say, and then the, and the kids would come up to him and say, well, should I do lateral condensation, vertical condensation? He goes, why don't you try sterile squirrel shit? <laughs> because it always teach you it's what you it endos about what you take out not what you put back in yeah you know exactly I mean? Yeah. I mean just get it's that still, baby clean it's right. true marcus you could probably speak a little bit about because you've had some cad cam experience i i have and i you know i i love the technology i about five years ago i don't know six years ago i i started doing sarek um <clears throat> in fact the first time i'd kind of seen him was on on uh on Dental Town, I, I, I'd seen Samir Puri and, and some of those guys doing some amazing stuff with Sarek. And I thought, you know, I love technology. This is what I want to do. So I started looking into it. I I, I drank the Kool-Aid and I got me a Sarek and uh, mm -hmm. I learned how to do it. And I, I felt, you know, I really, I enjoy doing it. It, it works really well. I when you, when you take the time to do the education and you, you pay attention to what you're doing, you can produce some very high quality stuff. But coming along with that is this huge, uh, you know, payment that you're making on this Sarek unit. I don't know very many guys out there that have 150,000 to just drop and buy that thing. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I, they tell you if you're doing this many crowns, you can replace the lab with this. Well, I still kind of had to use the lab for some things and, and, and it, it really became kind of a, a an anchor almost. I mean, the, the cost of having to pay for that thing each month and, and feeling like, man, I got to, I got to do more crowns. I got to, you know, and not that it's that way for everybody, but but some of that stuff, you can really put yourself in a bind by taking on some big debts. You're already coming out of dental school. I mean, I think today they're coming out with $350,000, $400,000 in student loan debt. Um, you know, you're going to come out and add another $150,000 just on a, on a, a, a CAD CAM machine. Um, you know, you're going to, I, I started out with a, a brand new building that was a $600,000 building. You know, I, I had to equip that thing. I mean, you can easily dig yourself a big, big hole by, by investing in. You bought a six hundred thousand yeah. dollar building. You fill that thing up. You buy a cad cab. You're a million under. Right. Oh yeah. 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 And then That's you sat dental school on top of that. Yeah. Going back to our whole discussion about advice for new people coming out or whatever. 
Um, that's a thing that you're finding now, too, is this student loan education, the cost is insane. I mean, I think we were a little over 200000 which I thought was absolutely ludicrous <laughs> at the time. You know, that was 13 years ago. And, uh, you know, then I bought a practice and then I did what Marcus did. We know my part, I have a business partner. I'm 50, 50 with another, with another gentleman. And, you know, we built a building and I mean, it is not that difficult to get in well over a million dollars in debt. And then, you know, with our, uh, our fees being locked in with these insurance companies and our, you know, overhead stays the same or can go up a little bit. It's very difficult to to budget and to to make things work in in the perfect environment. You know, you kind of think, you know, I want to own my own business and things like this. But man, it is a challenge nowadays with uh, with these insurance companies and terrible reimbursements and the, the other things that you have going on. So it's something to think about before you get out. Uh, you know, how am I going to pay this debt off? Because it's not just like we said. You don't just walk out of school and start just ching ching. Thank you for playing. I'm. I can pay this stuff off. It's it takes a lot of work. Marcus, I want to go back to you. Um, you liked the Sarek machine. My my best friend from dental school, Craig Steichen, he loves the Sarek machine. I mean, he literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if he had to pick between saving that or his wife or kids, he'd he'd have to <laughs> he, think about it for that. at least fifteen <laughs> twenty minutes. Uh, and he loves it. But but going back to dental school, he loved lab work. Did you like lab work? Mm. No, I didn't like lab work, and and to me, doing Sarek crowns doesn't feel like lab work. Um, you know, it's it, to me, it's more the technology, the sitting at the computer, the designing, the the creating, the creative part of it. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of lab work involved. Because you, I, I always like to try to find a deal. I mean, I, I equate if if you're not interested <clears throat> in technology or lab work or making stuff, and I and you go buy yourself a brand new piano. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna play any songs. You have to want right. to play the piano. And I noticed yeah. a lot of people thought, well, I could buy a Syrac and get rid of my lab bill, but they had no desire to learn. They didn't like the technology. They were phobic. They, you know, blah 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 blah. And so, you know, if it's the right fit, you'll love it. But if it's not the right fit, it, you know, that's yeah, Marcus is that's, definitely a techie. Marcus loves technology. Yeah. <laughs> But you know it's, it's true. true. You've got to. You've really got to look at stuff before you just jump in. I mean, it's easy to to get caught up in in the Sarek or or whatever it is and, and feel like, man, everybody's doing it. I want to do that. That sounds cool. But you're right. You've got to think about who who you are as a person. I mean, if you don't like lab work, if if you don't like technology, I mean, then then that's not gonna. It's not gonna just magically. Uh, you're not gonna love it and start using it like you should. Um, so you, I, I think, too often. Dentists, new dentists, especially, just look at things and say, oh, that, "That'll be great. I'll just, I'll just invest in that and I'll do it." I thought I took a docs course once with, uh, with uh, Ryder. I think you were. The, did, mm. We went to that together. Yeah. Um, I thought. Michael Silverman. You know what? Yeah. 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 I thought you know if I go to this docs course, I, I, I don't like treating real super anxious patients, but I, I thought you know what if I go to this docs course and I can sedate them, it'll, it'll make my life easier. I'll just, it'll be wonderful. Well, it, it turned out that sedated people don't always just magically go to sleep, and it's just easy to to work on them. Sometimes sedated people, if if a if somebody's a, a little bit of a, a an a hole in their normal life, they're probably still going to be just a sedated a hole, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. And I, Everything and doesn't I, always turn out. Yeah, and I think know? we found that, and Troy's done the docs course too. I think we found yeah. out that sometimes it's more stressful when they're sedated than it than it isn't, you know, when they're awake and. That was another thing w that we went to, and we walked out of there, Marcus. We probably spent what three thousand dollars at least yeah, on equipment easily, for that, yeah. and we did a few of them. And then we found out this really isn't all it's cracked up to be. I'd rather have them go see somebody else than than me have to sedate them myself. That, uh, that's how I felt. You know, I'm passionately against sedation. I mean, just passionately against it because as a businessman, I want to know my uh, my upside, my downside. It's kind of like parachuting. Mm -hmm. My my boys talked me into that one time. <laughs> You know, because the upside of parachuting is that that was a thrill, and I did it once. But the downside is really not good. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing the thing that I don't like about sedation is, um, let, let let's say you were doing it for economics, and you got you know two fifty uh, every time you stay at someone for a set of wids, and you did that once a week for a forty year career, and then one guy dies. Yeah. I mean, it's just I mean, yeah. and and everybody I know 
um, who I've communicated with that lost someone, it literally ruined their, their, their life. I mean, how do you feel good about your dental office when you're always thinking a little Amy that died? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and so no, the downside, and who's the, who's the highest paid specialist in medicine in America? An anesthesiologist. And they make more than the cardiovascular surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> they make more than the brain surgeon. They make more than any everyone because no one wants their job. And it's and it's uh it's like being an astronaut. I mean, I'd I'd rather just ride the Ferris wheel. I don't really want to be <laughs> yeah. the first guy that steps yeah. on the moon. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a lot of downside yeah. to that that decision. But uh, those that do it again, they can't sit there and say, "Well, I think this would be a practice builder." They're gonna have to become obsessed and. Yeah. OD, mm -hmm. you know, on all that information because, my God, when they put you on a witness stand and they bring in a board-certified anesthesiologist and they start cross-examining you, you can look like the tin man and the straw <laughs> man in about four seconds. But let, let, let's talk about uh, practice builders. You, you've been on a decade. Uh, what, what, what have you done that's, uh, you're sitting there thinking, good at you, mate. This was a, this was a great idea. Well, I think the best thing we've talked about is just being nice to your patients, telling them how much we appreciate them. You know, I know my my at my office, you know, people are surprised when we actually remember their name. And, you know, they come from a, another office and they're like, wow, you know, this, you know, at the other office, I was like a head of cattle. And you remember that I like I had a guy in yesterday and I remembered that he liked Tootsie Rolls and he loves that every time we talk about Tootsie Rolls. And he he loves it. He said he he's told me several times. I just really like coming to your office because you remember something about me. And my front office uh, girl that works for me, she always you know greets them with a smile and asks them you know how so and so is doing, you know how their husband's doing, and you know how their trip was, things like that. And I think Marcus and Troy would probably agree that you know making people feel welcome. I mean, it's bad enough to go to the dentist. Making people feel welcome is hugely important to get them getting them to come back, and then. You know, they've probably got fearful friends that don't want to come to the dentist, and they want to refer them to you, too. They'll never yeah, I, remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. It's yeah, true. it's true. I mean, yeah, I we, have we patients come in all the time. Well, remember when you did this crown? It's like, no. Well, we're doing <laughs> this crown on the whole other side. But the, but it, it, if you make them feel good, you know, same same thing with staff. Yep. I mean, I don't care what you say to your staff. I don't care what you're trying to do. If you make them feel bad, it ain't working. Yeah, yeah, and we've talked true. about that in our in our second book also that staff is important. And sometimes, you know, you always hear that the the customer is always right. Well, I don't think the customer is always right. I had a patient a couple of years ago that made my hygienist cry. I called him, and I mean, I was livid, and I I yelled at him. I told him he's never welcome in my office again. I think my hygienist appreciated that, but you know, sometimes you get a jerk in the office, and just because you have a jerk come in doesn't mean that your staff is wrong about whatever they did, you know. And and so, you know, I think. Keeping your staff happy is is important to making them feel good. I, I've read a few studies that say that praising your staff is usually more important to them than actually giving them money. So you absolutely, know, that's easy. yeah. Because the money might make them feel a little better, but your um, your words could make them feel a hell of a lot better. Yeah, if you tell them how stupid they are and then give them a hundred bucks, I think they're going to remember that you told them how stupid they are. Yeah, they wouldn't even remember the hundred bucks. No. Yep. Yeah, I think you talked about it earlier. I mean, just the, the customer service in generally anywhere you go is so so lacking. I mean, it's so poor. I mean, and so it, you really remember a place when you go there and they treat you differently. Um, you know, if I go to Best Buy, uh, you know, I may have somebody come up and just tell me, hey, hey, you find everything okay? I'm, I'm not on commission, you know. <laughs> but if I go to the Apple store, I mean, they're going to – I mean, it's just a whole different experience. And so I think if you can d distinguish your practice as a place that, that really, truly knows the patient, care about them, you greet them with a smile, you know, it, it can really make an impact on a person. Because even amongst dental offices, I mean, there's plenty of poor customer service. Well, it's funny because Walgreens and Best Buy <clears throat> has a greeter. Costco has a greeter. And it's not just dentists. You walk in any healthcare appointment in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and you're going to walk up to a mirror. Uh, they're going to notion to sign in. You're signing in like a cow. You're just <laughs> lucky that they don't open the window and brand you on your butt so they know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you walk into dental offices. That, that, that's all I see. I mean, it's, I mean, I almost never walk in in government and healthcare. It's the only two agencies that are completely in, insane. If I walk into government or healthcare, no greeting, no smile, no. So if you just differentiate yourself that you're not in healthcare, not in government, 
and you're actually in some type of service. I mean, like our favorite restaurants that we go to. I mean, the the, the either the owner or his wife or whatever. They come out. Oh, how are they come out? They give you a hug. They you know they just make you feel like you just came home for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yep. and, and you exactly may spend right. more at that restaurant than you would if you went over to the Olive Garden, but. You know, you're, you're going to go back to that place because of the way they made you feel. Yeah. Yeah, there's only yeah. two restaurants that have survived as long as my dental office right here. And I'm in Phoenix, but everybody, all the locals call it Awatuki. And uh, in Awatuki, there's only two restaurants that are still standing here uh, since I've been here. And uh, they've made it 29 years. There's a lot of big turnover in restaurants. And yeah. they're the ones that are not not are not the best food. They're the ones that are the most fun and personable and you know yep that's yeah. right so, my I, I bought the practice my my half of my dental practice from a gentleman who practiced for i think 52 years and that's one of the advice things that he gave me before he retired is you know if you treat people good they will treat you good and so you know and he had a very very successful practice um being from this town he was born and raised here and he had Everybody in, knew him, and he was a fantastic man. Still is. He's still alive. Um, but that was one of the things that kind of resonated with me, and that's kind of what I've tried to do, uh, continue on, is that, you know, treat the people good. You know, they'll never remember a lot about, you know, their fillings, unless they hurt, of course, or their crowns that you did or whatever like that. But they will remember how you treated them. And I think that that's the, the thing that gets you coming back. And that's what gets your, your patients talking to other friends and family about you, too. Um, you know, because if they don't like you as a person, they're never going to refer to you because you do fantastic dentistry. Yeah. Uh, at least that's been my, my take. Yeah, and Troy and I had a group leader in dental school. And I remember her telling us about a dentist that worked in her town or something like that. And she said, I don't, I, she said, I, I know he doesn't do that great at dentistry, but man, he sure is nice. And his patients just love him because he's nice. And that, that is totally true. You're nice to somebody. You said, you, you tell him thanks for coming into your office. I mean, how many people say thanks for coming into their store or anything anymore? And they really appreciate that. And I, and they're I have to happy. be real careful on exactly how I say this because, but like in my backyard, the, some of the most amazingly perfect orthodontist have some of the smallest practices because they make their patients feel bad. I mean, one of them, mm. uh, one of my patients went in there and he said, I'm not a trash collector. And he gave her a toothbrush and said, now get in there and brush your teeth. It's like, <laughs> wow. really? That's, I mean, I mean, yeah. and that might have, that might have been how his high school football coach made. Maybe that, maybe Vince Lombard, you remember that in Indiana where some coach threw a chair or whatever? Bobby yeah. Knight. Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight. Knight. Yeah. I'm sure that management style works for certain kids. But God, it don't work in a retail setting in orthodontics where the majority mm. are little girls <laughs> wanting to be pretty. Um, yeah. you know? And then there's yep. these two guys in my backyard crushing it. They have both have one thing, couple things in common. They're both Canadian, and it's just nothing but fun. You can't even look at them. You can't look at any member of their staff without just smiling, beaming. It's just fun, karma, yeah. energy, whatever. And the ortho is secondary to all that feeling, all that, you know. Yeah, and I and I we talked about this I think on our last episode that sometimes you need to know know your patient's personality. Some of them really want to have fun. They're there to, you know, talk and talk about their life and things like that. Some people are just total introverts like myself and they don't want any small talk at all. They want to get in and they want to get the dentistry done and get out. But everybody wants to be greeted. Everybody wants to be told thank you. And that's just how, you know, being polite to them is different. Being polite to them is just no small talk, doing the work and getting them out. Other people being polite is asking about, you know, their trip to, you know, Peru and wanting to see pictures and then talking about, you know, something else you have in common. It's just, it's important to know what type of patient you're dealing with. And sometimes your front office is huge with that. They can kind of, you know, vet, vet the patient before they come in and let you know what kind of person you're dealing with before they come in. And then you can adjust accordingly. I want to switch subjects uh, just out of curiosity because I don't know this about you. I know uh, uh, all I know is uh, I got uh, two of you uh, are uh, from Idaho, right? And one's from Utah. Are you guys uh, um, all married? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do your wives just just uh, to one wife, just to one wife though, me and you. Do, do your <laughs> wives uh, work and bring home revenue, or do they do, are they non revenue? My, my wife non revenue. My wife assists once in a while in my office, but never for me. 
just for her dad once in a while. But now that he's retiring, she will be fired, or terminated somehow, and not be working. <laughs> She's so. a How's that going to go what over your, your wife, marriage, Marcus? Yeah, my wife. My wife is a is a mom, stay at home mom. Okay, so yeah, I, I want to address kids. this very politically insensitive, uh, tough question. Um, <clears throat> and <laughs> the, this is so bad of a question. I'm going to just let you guys uh, fight over answering. So it seems like <laughs> it seems like the uh, the women in the class, thirty percent of the women dental students marry a male dentist in their class. The other 70% marry somebody equivalent. They're a dentist, physician, lawyer, banker, finance. They, they all have a nice job. And it seems like so many of the men uh, will marry a non-revenue, stay-home mom and have kids. And that's the meaning of life. The, the only great thing I ever did was have Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach. I mean, they're, they're my, whole, my four boys are my whole world. But some stay-home wives stay home and actually cook. Some stay-home wives, if you want to hide something from them, you put it in the oven. Some stay home wives <laughs> think, "Well, I married a rich doctor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a Mercedes Benz and an SUV, and then we're gonna take trips and spend." And and some of these dentists that I talk to, I mean, I mean, this has happened to me like ten times where I'm at dinner or lunch at a dental seminar, and this dentist is pouring out that he's overheads high, he's broke, he's bald, all this stuff, and all of a sudden, and his wife's just sitting there next to him, and all of a sudden, what doing whatever, and then all of a sudden, she, out of nowhere, she says, uh, oh my god, have you seen the new 26 Range Rover? Oh my god. <laughs> and he's like, are you from a different planet? Yeah. And then when you talk about um, communication with the staff, to communication with the patient, a lot of these doctors their wife, you know, the, the man will come home and say, I did five crowns a day. And she's saying, oh, those are a thousand each. God, we just made 5,000 bucks. She didn't know they were all on a PPO. So the adjustment was from 1,000 to 650. And then his overhead is 649. So, so talk, talk about that. How, so, so that was my segue to personal finance, which I think some people come out of dental school and think they're entitled to a million dollar house. A BMW, an SUV, skiing at Vail and Aspen. So talk about personal finance. Go around the deal and talk about personal well, finance. We, we actually had, when we first got into dental school, we had a uh, an old-time dentist that was there. I think he, <laughs> the guy drove a Rolls-Royce. Yeah. And and he he literally told all of us in, a, in, a, in an initial meeting, like all the dental students, that, that an important thing that you needed to do when you got out of school was look like a dentist. You needed to drive a nice car and you needed to have a nice home because that's what patients were looking at. And they needed to know that you were successful. Oh, my so gosh. That, I think was, you know, at the time I thought that's going to be awesome. Great. Yeah. That's what I want. I want to have all that stuff. But I think that was the exact wrong advice to give. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Ryder stated really well in one of our podcasts when he said, I think that's the worst advice I've ever been given in dental school. <laughs> I mean, could you think of something? I mean, his, his justification was that the, the truck driver had been out of school for, out of high school for like eight years and was making $40,000. So, you know, a year. And so we've got to start making money, but we've got to start looking like we make money so that we can actually make money because patients want to know that you drive. I mean, the logic was ridiculous. And... <laughs> You know, what I like about my wife, she, she gets a little spendy sometimes, but her dream car is a Honda Accord. And so I say, great, let's keep the, you know, the expectations at a Honda Accord. We can do that sometimes. I drive a 2008 Honda Pilot and I'm fine with that. And I, and I think the three of us, you know, we complain to each other about, you know, PPOs and, you know, dentistry and things like that. And maybe it's so we don't have to go home and complain to our wives about it. And my wife usually just asks me, you know, how was work? And it's either fine or it was terrible. And, you know, <laughs> then she'll let me vent, vent a little bit. But I, I think all of our wives are very supportive of us. And I don't think any of them are, like, out of control spending. And that's, and that's a good thing because I don't think we could keep up with it if, we, if they were. Now, Ryder, have you ever had to use your lightsaber on your wife? Uh, well, we'd like to keep that <laughs> private and not let it up to 33000 <laughs> But, you know... I have Kylo Ren right here with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I think a lot of you know, I used to this, I used to love it when uh, you're sitting with a dentist and you know, and they're sitting there talking about how you know the government, you know, like they're always ragging on the president. I mean, ever since I've been in college, I mean, it was it didn't matter if it was Reagan, Bush, it doesn't matter who it was. The dentists are always, then they're always saying, you know, they should cut Social Security, they should cut welfare, they should cut benefits. And I'm looking, I'm like, dude, you can't even. You can't even say that to one person, your wife. 
but you want the president to say that to a hundred million people. When did you go? When did you go tell Shirley that, and then take notes, and then all send it to Obama, and maybe he'll learn something. I mean, if you can't man up to Shirley, how is Obama supposed to man up to a hundred million people? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I I think having a real heart to heart with your spouse is probably important because we, the three of us, we're not independently wealthy. And I think having a sit down and explaining where this money's coming from, you know, your practice might produce a million dollars a year or something like that. But, you know, with PPOs, you're writing off 30 to 35 percent of that. And yep. then you got to pay all the overhead. OK, let, let's uh, yep. let's talk about uh, this. Um, they're, they're coming out of school and every dental student since Fred Flintstone has the same complaint. Why well, they didn't teach us enough of this. You know, they're, they're coming out of school and they're saying, look, we didn't do one case of Invisalign. We didn't do one ortho case. We didn't place one. In. And, they're, and, I'm, and I'm always giving them a reality check saying, dude, your, your dean took 100 kids off the street. And four <laughs> years later, they have a license to, to do what you do to people. I mean, that, that's frightening in and of itself. <laughs> but they're overwhelmed with marketing messages that they should go learn Invisalign, short-term orthix, um, sleep medicine, uh, CAD CAM dentistry, surgical placement of implants, surgical guides, and uh, go to Panky and Dawson and Coise and Spear and LVI. And, and so to do all these things is going to take them 10 years minimum to even get you know, weighed out to their knees. So, so what's the return on investment? When they're looking at all those marketing messages, where would you tell them to start? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, there wasn't it, uh, Gordon Christensen that said that until you've been out over five years of dental school, you're just like a safe beginner, like you're barely <laughs> even able to survive. And that's true. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I'm not a Panky guy. I'm not an LVI guy. I haven't done any of those courses. I've done a few, you know, docs courses and stuff like that. But you know, you really have to be careful with the return on investment thing. And we've talked about this in our books. We've talked about it in our podcast. You spend so much money just to get the diploma. You really don't get out of school and you have a whole surplus of, of other monies to go out and do more CE. Uh, my main thing would be focus on the basic stuff. I mean, what's the problem with doing the good class two composite? That's your, that's your bread and butter right there. How about a, you know, a crown? You know, things like that. You, those are the things you're going to run into every single day, all day long, for years and years and years. So if you can get good at those things, it doesn't cost you any additional money, uh, you know, as far as going to those courses and stuff. Wait until you get up on your feet and you have an idea of how much money you're actually going to make before you decide to spend all that money on those other things. That would be my take. And also maybe ask somebody that's been to those courses, like, do you actually do this stuff? Like, I mean, we could obviously tell yeah. people, you know, do you do sleep dentistry? Yeah, I've been to docs, but do I do it? No, but I've got a nice pulse oximeter that sits in my basement and yeah. it's not, it's not making me any money. I get no return on investment there. Exactly. You have to be yeah. very careful what you're buying because, you know, you're, you're marketed to heavily. I mean, <laughs> these guys are constantly in your office on your email, constantly trying to sell you something. And it's easy to get caught up in it because, you know, some of that stuff is really cool. Like, you know, Marcus has been able to enjoy the CAD CAM, but, you know, you have to look at the dollars and cents part of it and say, you know, do I really need that? Is it going to really generate me any more income? And in our PPO world that we're in now, we have to be extremely careful of that because it's very easy to, to do a procedure and not make any money and actually have money yeah. come out of your pocket if something goes wrong and you have to redo it. Very seriously, yeah, dude, I, I didn't even think Idaho I had PPOs. I thought they just bartered potatoes when they came in. Yeah, <laughs> they do that in Idaho. I wish. <laughs> we have plenty of those. Did, did you ever get to meet J.R. Simplot before he passed away? I did not. Actually, I live not far from where his whole headquarters is down here in Grandview, Idaho. It's about 25 miles just out here in that my town. That was here. my favorite billionaire Huge growing up. That was my favorite billionaire. The, the funniest yep. thing he ever said in my life, I'll never forget it, a news reporter said, uh, have you ever thought about being a governor of Idaho or maybe a senator? He goes, why? I own all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't even kidding. I mean, he just said yeah. it like, it's in, you know, that's in my back of my truck. What do you, why would I be a governor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's funny. Very good. Yeah. So, so, um, so is there any courses or equipment or anything that you've ever taken? Well, let, let me just say first that, um, to me, the street smart ones, like they want to learn how to place implants. 
they'll go buy Carl Misch's book for 150 bucks, and they'll read the whole thing like a novel. And then they might have to go back and read half of it. But it seems like the other 80% of the class wants to fly to some continuum that's $3,000 a weekend for, you know, six uh, deals. Same, same thing with veneer. There's aesthetic books, some of the greatest veneer cosmetic dentistry books on earth that are under 200 bucks, but they'll go pay $4,000 for a weekend course when the plane ticket to go to the course costs more than the book. There's <laughs> Dental Town with 4 million posts. Uh, courses on Dental Town cost like 18 bucks, 36 bucks, but that, 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 the course on Dental Town costs less than the cab ride from the airport to your hotel that you're going to stay at. And I, I just think YouTube, I mean, if you wanted to learn anything, just go to YouTube and type in, how do you do a root canal? And you couldn't watch all the yeah. YouTube videos True. until the end of time. Yeah, yep. so, uh, absolutely. So just, and, and then people will come back from these very expensive courses and I'll sit there and say, uh, show me your notes. And there's mm -hmm. like three pages of notes and half of it's hangman drawings. <laughs> You know, I had a local. I had a yep. local oral surgeon that you know. He said that he w he offered to teach me how to do you know some mini implants at at one point. I wasn't real interested at the time, but you know, I don't I, I don't think specialists would be totally opposed to helping helping you walk through some of those things. And that's a free thing. I mean, they're doing it as a favor to you. Obviously, they know you're not gonna. They they know you're not gonna tackle you know a five canal root canal. But if they could help teach you how to do a better premolar, well, you know, maybe an endodontist will actually teach you how to do that, help you out, tell you what kind of proceed, what uh, you know, materials he uses, and that's a free course right there. And you're not going to get a better course than that because you can actually call the instructor. You could call that oral surgeon or endodontist and ask him a question. You're not going to be able to do that with most of these other, you know, LVIs or you know, I you're know. not going to get great spear on the phone. The the best endo uh, CE I ever got was just going over to the endodontist's office, just sitting in a chair and assisting him because I didn't have any patients that afternoon or I had off Friday or whatever that, that just, just sitting there watching. Same with the periodon, same with the oral surgeon, same with all that stuff. Um, another thing they're getting bombarded with Invisalign. So D3, do you do Invisalign, not Invisalign? I, I took the I, I course. Don't. Yeah, I, I took don't. the course a year or two out of, out of school and it was because a couple other dentists in the building that I worked in at the time were taking it. So I thought if they're gonna do it, I've got it. You know, these guys have been out for 10 years. I've got to do it, I'm gonna keep up with these guys. I did one case and I thought this is this is stupid. An orthodontist goes to school for like two or three years to learn how to do this stuff. What what am I going to learn in two to three days? This is you know what am I thinking? So I I don't do any of it anymore. Try to you? Yeah. No, I do not. I don't. I I. Uh, so I three for three. Don't do that. this line. No. no. <laughs> okay. Here, right. here's, here's a very 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 common question now. Um, sleep medicine. Um, I mean, you 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 can't pick up any. You can't go to any dental convention in the world and not hear five guys talking about sleep medicine. And if you don't do it, all your patients are going to die in their sleep. What, do you guys? Do you guys do sleep medicine? I I do some snore guards. What about you guys? I've, that's yeah, I've done extent. I've done a few, but not. I I haven't gone to any extensive courses. I don't do sleep studies. I don't. You know, I, I've done a few simple little snore guards and uh, had reasonable success with them. Yeah, yeah, I, they've yeah. worked out fine when I've done them. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Jamison Spencer. He's a very popular speaker mm -hmm. around the circuit and things. And he, we have him right here in our backyard over here in Boise, Meridian area. And he is uh, kind of not, I mean, it's not a specialty, but he's done so much in sleep medicine, temporal mandibular dysfunction, uh, cranial facial pain. And, you know, there's really no reason that, that, you know, we'd go and just send people there and have him take care of them. He does a great job, and he's got vast knowledge of the situation, and they, they do all that. So we haven't <clears throat> gotten into that. He kind of looks like he's Ryder's uh, cousin. Uh, he does look very similar to Ryder, actually. He's got the yes. same hair, yeah. beard, color. I mean, Ryder, is, <laughs> yep. that your, uh, is that your nephew or first cousin? Uh, I think all redheads are related somehow. I, you guys I, both I Irish or Scottish? Or I don't know. I'm Utah. And I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that that's the point. I'm that's the point I'm trying to make to these kids listening. That when I go to a really successful practice, um, the dentist has you know is doing a big restorative practice and checking hygiene and busy all day. He's not placing implants. He's not doing sleep apnea. He's not doing Invisalign. He's not doing. He's he's just a dentist. And they're just yeah. doing fillings and crowns, and but they're making relationships, and they're building a hygiene department, and they're just building this big mass reputation, and people are coming in, 
and they're a big referral source to all these other specialists that do these little minor things. But I think so many dentists come out and believe that the successful dentists are Superman and they do sleep yeah. and TMJ right. and Invisalign and ortho. And I, I just don't see it. It'd be yeah, very difficult for people to be very proficient at all of that. I mean, like Ryder said, you know, orthodontists go to two extra years of school to learn how to position teeth and, and make sure they don't mess up somebody's TMJ and things like this. Oral surgeons go through an astronomical amount of additional, uh, you know, stuff to learn how to place implants, do s complex surgeries, take out teeth, different things like this. I mean, I, th I feel personally, it's just my opinion here and kind of the opinion I think of, of dental realists in general is that, you know, why don't we use these guys? That's what they're good at. I mean, that's why we have, you know, we got a tough molar endo. Let's send it over to the endodontist. For one thing, your patient loves you because you're not the one that beat the crap out of him in the chair for three and a half hours trying to do something. You were It was way over your head. Um, I had a lady in this last week that uh, a guy tried to take out a premolar on her. It took him three and a half hours to oh. get the premolar out. I don't know how that happens, and I don't know why he didn't just abort initially and say, you know what, this is too complex, and he's going to the surgeon. But, you know, my patients, I want them to have a good experience in my office. I'm really good at fillings. I'm good at crowns, bridges, uh, restoring implants. I have no problem. I do those all day. Um, but, you know, I let the specialists do what they're good at. And uh, we have very good relationships. And I, I stay busy. So I'm not, I mean, it's not like I have to grasp on all these things. And I think maybe that's, we'll go on to another point, is the reason why some of these guys are jumping on some of this other stuff is because they're not busy. And they feel like they have to get other things in their office to be able to do to keep them keep them busy but you know i i have no problem referring some of those complex things to to the specialist who do it way better than i can that's a good point yeah so. that's a good point in, in where i where i practiced in idaho falls for a long time i mean it was a saturated area and you did you almost felt like man i got to do everything i can't refer anything out because it's so tough to get patients in here i've got to keep everything that that patient needs in my office uh, and and that oftentimes just added to the stress for me, um, just trying to trying to feel like I had to do everything. I couldn't refer anything out, and uh, yeah, yeah. And the and the risk, you know, if you try a, a root canal and it fails, well, you might lose a patient over that. And losing a patient, I mean, how much money are you losing over your career if you lose one patient? I mean, that adds up just with hygiene appointments. If you send them out to get a root canal done, you might lose, you know, five, six hundred bucks or something like that. But you're not going to lose money over time after that. And so, and I, yeah, and I got to make one more point um, that, you know, for us guys that make it, you know, you know, my price been 29 years. I've seen a lot of uh, great dentists and I've seen a lot of great failures, seen a lot of dentists fall down, a lot of them get back up. But never work with an employee or do a dental procedure that you don't like. If you exactly. if you yeah. pay an employee, exactly. you know if if you can't stand one of your employees, it's toxic. <laughs> it's going to cause yep. depression. The depression might lead to a bunch of other negative behaviors, drinking, whatever the heck, burnout, disease, depression. And if you, I mean, I had a dentist one time said he'd rather be beat with a belt than do a root canal. And I'm like, dude, they're called endodontist. <laughs> Yep. Because if you exactly. go in there and do a procedure that you hate for money, I mean, uh, you know, people who do things they hate for money usually end up with substance abuse, disease, burnout, depression. It's it's priceless to be happy. It's priceless to go to work. So I want to. Uh, we're out of time. I want you to say um, review then the name of your two books and where to get them and how do you download their podcast and and then I want Ryder to finish with. What the hell is a Star Wars <laughs> podcast called Idiots Array and writes blogs for Coffee with Kenobi? Is that Obi-Wan Kenobi you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I don't understand my infatuation with Star Wars because I was a big Star Trek fan. I don't read science fiction. I don't, you know, I always read business books, history books, science books, but oh my God, do I love Star Wars. It makes no sense. Yeah, I, I, no I love sense Star my Wars. Love for Star Wars and the NFL, I, I just say okay. <laughs> everybody's got that one dumb, useless thing in their life, and uh, but uh, so talk about that. Well, yeah, Idiots Array is a podcast I do with two other guys that I was asked to do oh a year and a I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, and we 
every two weeks we talk about Star Wars. We break it down. We talk about, you know, does your lightsaber determine your, you know, your destiny? Do you, uh, you know, how important was Qui-Gon Jinn to the entire the entire Star Wars saga? We, I mean, we, we go in depth. We compare it to, you know, other mythology. Uh, we talk about our experiences, different conventions, uh, things like that. And Coffee with Kenobi is another podcast. I, I've been a guest on there. I just write a monthly blog for them about kind of the same thing, my experience with Star Wars, what I like. Uh, so did you like the, 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 like. Number, the seventh movie, the one that uh, Disney bought the uh, franchise, the, and uh, they just come out with the seventh one? I loved it. Yeah, I've I went and saw it. I think seven times at the theater. I I I love it. I could talk about Star Wars all all day long. I'm not sure I could talk about dentistry all day long. And who's your favorite character? Obviously, Darth Vader. Uh, it is Darth Vader. He's yeah. the most complex. He's the most conflicted. He has the most uh, depth to him. And uh, I mean, we probably don't have time to go into it. If you want to sit around for a couple more hours, we can do that. But Darth Vader, yeah, Darth Vader's number one. Han Solo is number two. But I always wanted to be Luke Skywalker. And who? And, and, and if someone said to you, "There's two hundred. There's two million dentists on Earth alive today. There's two hundred eleven thousand alive in the United States today. What Star Wars character would you say resembles the average dentist?" Uh, probably the Sarlacc pit because they're always just grabbing at whatever they can get and <laughs> you know chewing up <laughs> using whatever they can take. <laughs> and, and which character would would represent the patient? Uh, oh, probably Princess Leia because they're just so pleasant and delightful to see every day. Okay, and the uh, and the dental insurance company. <laughs> oh, uh, that's the Emperor because they're the most evil thing in the galaxy, <laughs> the most self centered. My God, I want I want an article for Dental Town just on this. That would just be classic. If you ever want to write an article with Dental Town I, with a bunch of Star Wars uh, uh, deals, that would just be. I'll make. I think that would be awesome. I would love that. You know what's funny? One time, Ryder got on this thing on Facebook, and he was posting uh, X-rays of uh, Star Wars action figures yeah. and giving a uh, reward to those people who could depict who it was. It looked pretty cool. Yeah, that, that was actually kind of fun. Yeah, I wrote I wrote an article for uh, Coffee with Kenobi la two months ago about. Uh, how the dark side of the force compares to tooth decay. So if anybody wants to check that out, then go to coffeewithkenobi.com. And you can find our Idiots Array, you can find on, on iTunes. We're, we're all over. We're huge. And how do they find your, yeah. uh, their dental podcast? They can find it on the Dental Town app. Um, yep. yeah. where, where, where do you put it all on? Oh, it's on Libsyn. Uh, we're also on iTunes, of course, on Dental Town, which we really appreciate that uh, that forum to be able to put it out there. Um, those are the three main places to find the podcast. The books, uh, the first book, so you want to be a dentist. You can find that on Amazon, iBooks, you know, all over the place. Also, a print copy if you wanted through Lulu.com. The second book, uh, so now you're a dentist, is exclusively Amazon.com. Uh, but we, we have a website, www.dentalrealist.com, and uh, yeah, we, hey, we, we love connecting with people. I just got a great market idea. This just fell out of my rear. Um, <laughs> you have a podcast. Your Star Wars is always fun. Uh, I uh -huh. have a podcast. You ought to write a, a funny article and plug some uh, your podcast, my podcast, some, something informational, plugging, you know, whatever, because uh, – the reason I'm, I'm so in love with uh, podcasting is, you know, I want everything to be faster, easier, better, cheaper. And yeah. I think mm -hmm. that the dentist that got out of school and took, you know, 100 or 200 hours of CE for 10, 20 years, they learned so much. So I thought, well, they only got a study club. It's only once a month. It's after work. They got family. They don't want to. They want to go home. They're tired. They don't want to drive across town, eat rubber chicken. All so I start <laughs> saying I can get. I mean, I've got on this uh, this podcast, I mean, I, I've got so many people from Endo and Perio and Pedo and TMJ and Prax Management. I love podcasts because they got an hour commute. They're on the yeah. treadmill. They're on the bike. This is the ultimate faster, easier, better deal. But you should write up an article and talk about uh, uh, tying your Star Wars. That'd be cool to podcast uh, that, uh, you know, I mean. Why, why, why would you drive an hour to work and listen to all this crap about Trump and Hillary? And by the time you get to the office, you're having angina, and you just think America should be flushed down the toilet. And you're all mad at the world. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather drive to work and get pumped up, fired up, and learn something about my trade. I mean, 
When, when, when my four boys are watching uh, uh, CNN or Fox News, I mean, I, I leave the room. I, I don't even want to hear it. I mean, I'm too old for that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah. But, yeah, if you ever want to do that, that would be fun. But, uh, hey, yeah. thanks for awesome. all that you do for dentistry. Thanks for yep. all your podcasts. Thanks for everything. And uh, thanks, thanks for having you. With me today. Appreciate it. We and appreciate having us on. And I'm sorry I would end with my lightsaber, but uh, it's being recharged right now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, thanks. Howard.